Welcome to Revelation Reimagined, where we get to delve into the book of Revelation with all its mysteries, all that it says about the end times and the end of the world, and actually, as we've been discovering, all that it says about Jesus and has Jesus at its heart. So we will keep discussing the book today, what does it say to our lives, and as we explore it, we hope you'll find new ways to read and understand and appreciate this, this apocalyptic book. On the panel with me today, I have Peter Hughes, Itui Fanini, and Roman Halupka. My name is Darren Croft. We are four Adventist pastors who love to study the book of Revelation and believe that it speaks to us today. And so last time we had a big bite, almost got a bit of indigestion as we looked from chapters 8 to 11 with the trumpets and the little scroll and the two witnesses. Well, today we're going to slow down a little bit. We're just doing one chapter. And today, as we, we saw last time that so much of Revelation points to Jesus, we're going to see something emerge out of chapter 12 that's going to be pretty interesting, I think you'll find. And so, you know, as last time we saw that sometimes the, the experience of following Jesus can be both sweet and bitter before we call back to it. Now, as we look at this chapter, we're going to see some light, but also some dark. So before we go any further, we, we will actually take the time to read through chapter 12 together shortly, but we just want to do a bit of a, a background so you get the sense of where chapter 12 fits in the flow and big picture of Revelation. So first question, what is the big picture of Revelation 12? We've introduced people to chiasm in previous sessions, and a chiasm is reversing parallels. In, a, in fact, the first point will match the last point. The second point matches the second last point in that process. But the middle, the centre, is the focus of the message. So here we've got the book of Revelation as a chiasm. And the first two chapters that we looked at were the seven churches. And John was being given a vision of the life in those seven churches and how they would apply down through the time from Christ to the second coming. Then we looked at chapters three and, uh, 4 and 5, and in 4 and 5 we saw Christ on the throne in heaven. And that a little contentious for some people maybe, but the whole book is about Christ. It centres on Christ, and here he is re-established, sharing his Father's throne. The second last point in this case is Christ reclaims his kingdom. You see the parallel. He's sitting on the throne in heaven and now in the second last point he claims that throne of heaven and becomes the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. In the third point, Jesus opens the seven seals. We did that presentation a couple of weeks ago. That means God is looking to focus on the law and those people who understand that and have are given white robes. The law is the means by which judgment happens. So the third last point, chapters 17 and 18, is judgment on the power, on the earthly power that has controlled men's lives during this period of time from the death of Christ until his second coming. The fourth point, the seven trumpets, the warnings of the judgments that will come, match God's wrath being poured out in the seven last plagues. God is going to punish all those people who have deliberately hurt others and turned away from him. And the focus in this chapter is Satan counterfeits the mark of the beast. His counterfeit is the mark of the beast. Let me say it properly. And that counterfeit is he is trying to deceive the world to believe that he is worthy of your worship. And if you worship him, he is doing it through deceit. So that's a quick overview. Of so, so, so this is a bit of an insight into the Hebrew way of thinking, if you like, because our way of thinking, if we were writing it, 
we'd have a beginning and we'd build, yeah. build, build until you got to the end mm -hmm. and then there'd be, be this grand ending. Yes. Whereas they implicitly understood that you would build up to the big picture in the middle and then it would taper off and, and so it was a way of... It would um, reverse. Yeah, yeah. Th different to how we would do mm. it. Because mm. um, so even in my culture, yeah, the conclusion is the climax. Yeah. So we will have to think differently here. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so as we hit chapter 12, and, and interestingly here, what you see um, on this, this chiastic chart we don't actually list chapter 1 and chapter 12 on it. And there's reason for that. Because chapter, chapter 1, of course, introduces Jesus. And chapter 12 is like a hinge. The book kind of, it, it's leading us to the second half of the book, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the first half of the book was all about Christ. Christ's work in his church. And he's and actions, giving you an yeah. overview. And now the second half is being defined by Satan and how Christ responds to Satan. That's an interesting point, Darren, because it's with the, before we move on to the, a little bit more detail, there were three main characters there. And every time they introduced, you know, two things happen there. We see a, a brief history or, a, and we also see a, a, a visual description and a brief history. Uh, for those three characters, the dragon, the woman, and the male child. But when it comes to the male child, it's different. It doesn't introduce, doesn't give us a, a, a visual description, doesn't give us a, a, a brief history. And it, and it looks like it's because it's been in that story before, from chapter one. Yeah, interesting. I, yeah. I hadn't actually thought of that because, yes, as we, as we hit chapter 12, there is explanation of some mm. things, but, but not that. And, um, but we are not forgetting about the picture of Jesus in this chapter. Because inter introducing Satan and his work, it doesn't exclude Jesus from the picture. No, he is there. And, and, and he is yeah. always the overcomer. But, but you know, that's very interesting that, that this approach from the, from the picture of Satan that suddenly for the first time appears in the book. Mm. And it's named, and we know who is it. Mm. So that's it changes completely the scenery. So how is how is Christ shown in chapter twelve, Rome? Well, in chapter twelve, we start with with a little boy who is born, okay. uh, and that's that's where we start. But then then as a lamb who, because of his blood that was shed, you know, he's still present, you know, and people are overcoming in his name. And and yeah. to the end, you know, we all the time we see him. The, the, the interesting thing is, John in his gospel doesn't recount the story of the birth of Jesus. Yeah. Only Matthew yeah. and Luke do that. Yeah. And so in, in a way you could say Revelation 12 is actually John's account mm. of the birth of Christ. The only account that he yeah. gives us. Yeah, that's, that's interesting yeah. because yeah. it's missing in the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, as Peter said, it's mm. in the context of the, the devil yeah. that you know, on the warpath. It's, it's, it's showing Christ in his mm. humanity, isn't it? Mm. He was mm. born as a child. Yeah. He mm. put aside his divinity and now he was human. Well, well he was, he was, <laughs> he, ex you know, when you look at what he experienced, he's on the receiving end of trauma. Mm. He's born to incredibly poor parents. Um, he is hunted before he's two years old and there's a yeah. whole town that lose all their two-year-old boys. They flee as refugees down to Egypt. Yeah. They come back. They don't come back to their hometown. They come back to, to Nazareth. Um, you know, this is, sometimes we think of this, you know, beautiful, quaint picture of baby Jesus and growing up. It was a tough life. Mm. And, and I think chapter 12 starts to give us a bit of a, an insight of you know what it meant for Jesus to be born into this world and to grow as the Messiah, the mm. you know the promised one that that came. Mm. Um, I, I so so this is the hinge chapter. We now move into the more um, yeah greater focus on the work of the devil and end time events from here, don't we? Mm. 
It's a climax because it's here we see, as we mentioned last in our last episode, the crescendo, you know, the, yeah. of, the, of the story building up. Now we reach the climax where the devil's lies are now exposed. Mm. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's more than 10 times you'll find the word or the phrase to the one who overcomes, to the one who is victorious. Um, and it, it appears that this chapter is about a battle, a, a war yeah. uh, between, uh, uh, you know, the lamb and, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we're literally peeling the curtain back yeah. and seeing the behind the scenes picture. Yeah. And um, so, so we'll just give you a bit of a sense of how Revelation 12 is developed. So we see this progression where Satan is on the attack. In, in So the, the verses 1 to 3 of Revelation 12, you've got Satan attacking the woman. Then you go to verses 4 to 6 and Satan attacks the son. Then 7 to 9, you've got Satan attacking Michael and the angels in heaven and he is defeated. Then you hit verses 10 to 12, Satan attacks the lamb, but the blood of the lamb overcomes. Hey, good news. Then verses 13 to 16, Satan attacks the woman again. <laughs> There's a certain consistency, if nothing else. Yeah. And then the final verse of Revelation chapter 12, where having succeeded partially, no longer is the woman in the gun, it's now Satan attacks the woman's offspring. So as we read through the chapter, just keep this, this progression in mind. Uh, we won't put the verses on the screen for you, but we are going to read through together in these chapters. Peter, you want to jump in? I want to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You, you talked of, you, you, in your explanation, you pictured the woman in the first three verses and the son in the next verses. Yeah. What's the difference between that woman and the woman after Satan attacks Michael? What's the difference between the two women and the two? I guess we see the, my understanding would be that the, the initial woman is probably partially a reference to Israel, but even more a reference to Mary yes. as the, the mother of Jesus. But of course, as, as things develop, this woman actually becomes, which is a common mm -hmm. Old Testament symbol, a, a symbol for the church. church people. Mm -hmm. so, so the first one would be the woman in heaven and the nation of Israel. The second one would be the woman who is the, the spiritual church. successor mm -hmm. yeah. on yeah. earth. Yeah. Yes. yeah. No, good. Worth picking that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So look, let's, uh, and I hope you've got a Bible with you. We're going to read from two different translations just to, to give you a, um, a, a bit of a flavour of how it renders it in, in different translations. But um, Tui will, will lead us out. So thanks. And um, if you haven't got a Bible, pause it. Go grab a Bible now so you can follow through with us. I'll read from uh, chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 1 to verse 6 from the New International Version. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Taking up the reading from chapter, chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So I continue from verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of a lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they didn't love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. When the dragon, from verse 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time. Out of the serpent's reach, then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth, the dragon had, sorry, but with, but the earth, verse 16, helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And that's chapter 12. A lot in it. <laughs> so we've touched on the, the, the woman. Anything we want to add about this woman? Because here we've got this light, bright, white, uh, the colour white again, Peter? Yes. The, this white woman. What's it telling us about this woman who's clothed in the sun and the moon and in... She's in harmony with God. Yeah. They're all, if you remember, in, when we touched on the seals and the white horse, white or brightness or purity or truth symbolised an understanding of God and God in the person's heart. Yeah. So this was a, a woman who walked with God. Yeah. So there's, there's alignment. Mm. Yes. Alignment with God. Yeah. So this is the first character um, mm. in the story um, where we see, first of all, the woman, the first character, with a, uh, a kind of visual description which says that um, great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the, with the moon, with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars under her, her head. So it's given a clear kind of a, a visual description. And then verse 2, she was pregnant, brief history, um, and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So first character, as I said before, visual description. And, and a brief history. And, and number 12 pops up? Yes. That's right. Kingdom of God number? Mm. Yes. Yep. 12 tribes of Israel. Yep. Can I mention that the light that she was clothed in were all of the sources of light for this earth? Physical sources, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Mm. They mm. eclipse all of the sources of physical light on this earth. So this way we are just underlying that... Woman here is a symbol. Yes. It uh, is symbolize the church of God. That's, that's how the old Bible God, is yeah. pointing out all the time. And, yeah. and that's, I love this symbol because, yes. you know, if, if we are the church of God, then at the moment we are called by him that we are the bride. So, so 
he's our bridegroom. Mm -hmm. So it closes us again to Jesus, and that's so important. So this symbol is absolutely beautiful. I heard quite often that people uh, try to see mainly uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and, well, it can be obvious at the moment because the child is born afterwards. Mm -hmm. but, and we know that, yes, this lady was chosen by God to, mm -hmm. to, to be the tool just to deliver uh, the child, uh, son of God. But at the same time, well, we have the greater picture. Yes. That's, that's important to keep in mind all the time, yeah. that it is the church, the church. Mm. In this case, that's the church in the Old Testament, mm. Israel. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, the not so faithful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to add to? Yeah, yeah, the church of God in the Old Testament yes. and the New as well. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah, there is actually continuity there, that's isn't right, there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's those who are faithful to, oh. to, to God, to Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a couple of passages, if, if you haven't come across this idea of the, the woman representing God's people, you know, Isaiah 54, verses 5 and 6, that's worth a, a look at. And, of course, you know, the whole book of Hosea is built around, yeah. well, Hosea, um, he is a prophet of God. He takes a wife who turns out to be anything but a faithful wife and God comes mm. to Hosea and Can says, say you know, pursue yeah. her, bring Goma back, love her. And the whole thing's this incredible, I guess, object lesson of what God does for his people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yes, this idea of, of the woman is not a new one. It's, it's actually a very old one by the time we encounter it in Revelation. And we're going to encounter it again as we get towards the end of the book of Revelation. All right, so that's the, the woman. Let's, let's move on there in chapter 12. And we, we could pick on, let's, let's just touch on the dragon as we go past the dragon. So this sign appears in heaven, an enormous red dragon. Who's the dragon? Well, scripture tells us it's the devil and Satan. So this is the introduction of Satan into the book of Revelation. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And he's got seven heads and seven mm -hmm. crowns on the heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's telling you that a crown represents... Yeah. Well, crowns are very significant at the moment in this mm. point of yeah. time. Mm. Yes. And that, that he is a king. A head mm. is a king. Yeah. So it is mm. going to be seven powers that work mm. with Satan to overcome the people of the earth. Yeah, yeah, like the uh, like the woman. Um, there's a hint here about who the dragon is, because like the woman, in verse three, the dragon appeared in heaven in enormous red with seven. So there's a visual description as well again, and then in verse four, which is kind of peed on myself, kind of, you know, have a, uh, you know, different views on it. Uh, it gives a little bit of, of history there mm -hmm. of the dragon. It tails swept a third of the stars out of the sky, flung them to the earth. So it, it, it seems to me that this is alluded to an earlier war. This is a, a brief history of this uh, dragon here. That gives us a little idea of who the dragon is. Yeah. This is a big um, sweep of history story, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, you know, we know that the, you know, Lucifer as he was originally, um, well, he's, what he was saying was at odds with what God was That's saying. Right. Yeah. And um, there was a rebellion and he ended up with some followers. Yeah. Yeah. In this way, we have again the connection with the previous chapters. Yep. With the yeah. story of, the, yeah. of God's nation, of, of God's church on this earth. Yeah. Because who was, who was against? Why those yeah. colors, especially this red color, this black color, and pale in the end? Yeah. Well, the attack of Satan. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you might need to look at uh, some other texts like Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, to tell a little bit about the history of that dragon. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good passages yeah. to look at. Yeah. I actually remember a conversation I had with someone a number of years ago, and they they kind of took the view that no, the the devil's not you know a really real. And I said, yeah, but look at what it says in Revelation here in chapter twelve. It says that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, and they leapt on me and said, 
Yeah, but it just says he was called that. It doesn't say he actually was that. Um, and yet, I got to got to drop this in. You know, Revelation twenty verse two. It repeats the statement, yeah. but instead it says there he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan. Oh, so God. lest we mistake what verse you know chapter yeah. twelve is saying, it actually elaborates on it later yeah. further. Can can we just go? Um, to Michael, yes. Before we come to your parallel, because yeah. I want to, I yeah. want to touch on Michael while we've done the the dragon, because there's a counterpart thing that's going on here. Um, well, let me just come straight out. Yeah. Who's Michael? Where's Michael appeared from? The Book of Daniel. So he features only in Daniel and Revelation, <laughs> right? No, and in Jude. All right. In that he, he, he occurs five times in scripture, but the two most significant ones are in Daniel and now in mm. Revelation. Yeah, and that. See, Michael and the and the male child, which is the th who is the third character, they don't not like the woman and the dragon. They don't have a visual description or a brief history here. Yeah, it's For like some you should reason. know who this yeah. is. Yes, yeah. uh, and and. It, well, further down, we know that they, they appeared in multiple characters' uh, names. So that tells us that that male child or that Michael has been in the, in the story before. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yes. Roman, anything to, to add? What, what's the context that Michael usually appears in? Well, we mentioned a few times before in our sessions that he's overcomer, so he's fighting. He, he's, he's the commander of God's army. He, he's the one who appears just to, to show the support from the Lord, how, how, he's, how he's fighting just to save us, to do everything. So that's very important to keep it in mind. But that's interesting in the order here because uh, not calling the Michael, he's in fact as born child mm. <laughs> but you know but he, first he has to be born yeah. here and then he appears suddenly as this overcomer mm. uh, over satan and that that's that's mm. enriches quite much yeah. is the whole picture so so the literal translation of of michael's name is who is like god yeah, yeah. Mm. and look people some people will probably try to argue over the identity of mm. michael and I guess all I would say is yeah. every time Michael appears in Scripture, it's it's in connection to Jesus functioning as the commander of the Lord's army mm -hmm. as such. And and so the, the way I boil it down is just to say Michael is Jesus' war name. And and I, I you know I don't think it's the the be all and the end all, but it fits the context of Scripture. That's a very interesting point there, Darren. It, it's a war name. Because the next verse is that then there was war in heaven. Yes. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yeah. Come back to you, Peter. We've been looking at colour uh, in yes. this understanding of revelation. And we had the first horse was white, Christ, light and purity. The second was red, which was warnings of sin and of bloodshed, of that type of thing. Now we've come in chapter 12 to the third colour, mm. and the third colour is black. And this, this chapter is all focusing on Christ and Satan at war, mm. because Michael is the commander of the armies of the Lord, as we've just spoken mm. about. So he's in conflict with Satan, the one who is described here, and black is the opposite of white. So there is no light, there is no truth, there is no purity. In fact, red and black go together. Mm. Mm. So this, this sequence in the book is all about Satan and the colour that represents it like, is black. I guess there was a reason Jesus called Satan the father of lies. Yes, and yeah. a murderer yeah. from yeah. the yeah. beginning. Yeah. I, I often think about these, this passage in verses 7 and 9, you know, this war in heaven picture. Um, it's not a picture that naturally comes to mind. You know, I think of heaven as light, bright, beautiful, not a venue for war. Mm -hmm. And and I, I guess what do you what do you see when you read these these verses? 
Well, the, the timing becomes interesting. The timing becomes very interesting yeah. when we read these verses. If there's war in heaven, it mm -hmm. would suggest that that war had begun before the earth. Mm. I would take it as beginning before oh. the earth, and yeah. now it is continuing. Yeah, mm. so the earth gets caught up in the, the, this battle. Mm. Satan brought the dispute that was in heaven to earth. Mm. and yeah. included the, the earth that had just been created into this war. And now Christ is standing in defence of this earth yeah. against mm. Satan. So, so you've got Satan hurled down to the earth as it pictures it. Yeah. And, then, and then you have, um, well, we've gone past this time period. I, I do want to just ask about the time period. So we've got at the end of verse 6, where the woman flees into the desert mm -hmm. and is taken care of for 1,260 days. And then down into verse 14, again, there is a parallel time, um, again with the woman, pictured of a time, times and half mm -hmm. a time. What's the, the prophetic time period without, because we, we do pick this one up again in future, but... Just introduce this to us. Who wants to tackle that one? Yeah, so it's almost like you've got different different photographs taken, isn't it? Yeah, so the movement is, is fascinating to me. Um, the time and the movement in the story. But yeah. it helps to understand. You know, you just go back in time, mm -hmm. and now you'll have to realise what the power is. Yeah. yeah. So, so well, we do that in novels sometimes, don't we? Yeah. You'll, you'll introduce yeah. it now, exactly, and then yeah. it travels back in time. That's what we do, yeah. So that's that's the way. And, mm. and John is using this, you know, just yeah. taking us back uh, now and, and explains. And that's, well, and that, yeah, I have to come to this to this time, <laughs> you know, that you mentioned. And, you know, so we yeah. we have that the, the, the woman had to flee, and, and she's suddenly find a place in a desert, in a wilderness. So, of course, it's, it's not a place, it's just empty place <laughs> that we say, where, where she cannot be attacked so much. So that's, that's a rescue for her. And 1260 days. Well, I should mention that it appears seven times in the Bible. Two times in the book of Daniel, five times in the book of Revelation. Uh -huh. And that's not... More links, more links. Uh, yeah. And, and there, is, there is even more, that, you know, it's, it is not always 1260 days. <laughs> that sometimes it, mm. it's, you know, three and a half times, yeah. or the other time, 42 months. Yeah. So, so, and as we calculate, because we know that how, how to look at the periods in prophecy, mm. uh, I should underline in only in prophecy, because some people would like to, to do it mm. in, in some yeah. other occasions. No, that, that's only in, in prophecy, where, where we know, and you know, 42 months as we mm. change into the days, and in those same months it's yeah. always 30 days, so it gives us exactly the same amount, you know, yeah. 42 months, there will be uh, 1260 days, and you know... Which, which three, also happens to be yeah. three and a half yes. years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and three and a half years, that's the same. So, so in this way, we, we know exactly that, that we are talking all the time about the same period. Mm. Well, now we have the problem. So we don't know what the period is unless we know where to start to count. Mm. What about the devil's strategy here? Now the woman fled to the wilderness. The male child snatched up to heaven. Yeah. And so the dragon now, <laughs> you have to choose 
which one to pursue first. So, and so <laughs> yeah, so, so look. Let's take the mother. I know. Yeah, yeah, keep, keep going with this because, so the woman's in the wilderness. Is a wilderness a good place to be or a bad place to be? It's a symbol, like a lot of things in Revelation are symbols. It's a place where there are few people. It's a remote place so that people can hide from the influence. Yeah, yeah, but, but so, I, I want you to go back further. Go, go back in history, in the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's not the good place to be so when, on one side. When Israel was in the wilderness, yes. why were they in the wilderness? Because of their sin. Okay. But what happened for them in the wilderness? They had to die there. Mm -hmm. it, it brought them to a realization that yeah. they had moved away from God yeah. and that they were not in harmony with him. Yeah, I'm seeing more though. Okay. Well, you tell us. What you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, when you look at the place of, often we look at the wilderness and say, you know, it's this terrible place that they were. And yes, there's a sense of that. But the wilderness was where they learnt dependence on God. Mm -hmm. yes. And the wilderness in their weakness became a place of strength. And it's interesting in that context that when Jesus starts his ministry, we look and say, oh, you know, he has these 40 days in the wilderness. Terrible. No, that was the place of mm. strength. Yeah. Because that's where we learn mm -hmm. and, and experience dependence on God. So I actually... I see there's, there's some bad about it. And I, I'm not saying that what you've said yeah. isn't there, Peter, but I think there's a, there's a deeper, yeah. for me, there's yeah. a deeper yeah. sense yeah. there. Yeah. And that's where Jesus started his ministry as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this way, uh, in context of the woman, so that's the place the woman can learn more to depend on God. That's one side. Mm. In the face and of notice persecution. his presence, yeah. yes. and, and she is she is she is absolutely aware of the fact that God led her there because he he gave her the place where to flee, mm. where mm. to escape. So that so that's mm. that's the other thing. So yeah. so that's positive thing. Yeah. Of the for for the woman to have to flee means that Satan has been attacking, and he's got to the place where her safety is in a desert or in a remote place of the earth. Yeah. So that yeah. a period of time has elapsed. Yes. Yeah. And if we understand that period of time correctly, it's somewhere around five to 600 AD yeah. that she has to flee. And she is in that place for 1260 years because of the war that the dragon is Right. Yeah. So there's some Old Testament precedent where a day mm. represents a year, yes. which we will pick up again. But I have in, a question, in though, yeah, go. maybe with the, these two, of the devil, of the, the dragon now, because now the, the, the woman fled to the wilderness and the, the, uh, the male child snatched to heaven. Yeah. And all of a sudden, now there's a war in heaven. The dragon is all in heaven now. To this part of the story, when, when did he when did he go back to heaven? Well, this is I think where that key verses ten to twelve really is is critical, right? Because in in here, yeah, the, there's been war, but in verse eleven, well, verse ten is all about the accuser. You know, salvation has come. Verse eleven, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. What's that? That's what happens with Jesus on the cross, right? Mm. So they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. So um, it seems from the reading here in chapter 12 that the cross is the critical event, because from that moment on, Christ is victorious. We have the ability to overcome him by the blood of the lamb. And, and the heavens are glad because he's gone from there. But woe to you on earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. So he's, he's, we're yeah. stuck with yeah. him. I, I'm just thinking, sorry, sorry, um, Roman. I'm okay. just thinking when he went back to heaven, whether that's where the snatching referred to the, the ascension, right? Uh, I, I don't know. You, you yes, it. yes. Uh, and then, so 40 days after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven. 
But the Holy Spirit didn't come for another until 10 days. Yeah. For the next 10 days. And I'm wondering what happened in those 10 days there? Was that, uh, was that where this war um, was going on there? I'm, I'm trying to make the connection with chapter 5 as well about the enthronement and, you know, the scene of... Uh, um, yeah, I, I feel free to jump in. I mean, my take on it would be that, you know, Revelation 5 is, is about the, you know, ascension of Christ to King. Yeah. Um, and so Acts, you know, Acts chapter 2 is an extension of that where Christ is anointed as king mm. and that anointing comes to earth via the, the Holy yeah. Spirit. And, and so, yeah, sure, there's still a war going on, but this war is a war that started way, way back, back before the beginning. Yeah. Tui wants, wants us to say in those 10 days that Satan was cast out of heaven to earth and he brought his host with him and I think that's probably a good way of explaining it but once he's here on earth he is going to because of his anger and wrath of being thrown out of heaven he's going to wage war against God's people yeah yeah wow. and it's that war that we are now unfolding in chapter 12 through to the end of the book yeah yeah and and look I don't I can see where you're going with it. I don't know whether it's an over-interpretation. Um, I, I, mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look more at that. I don't necessarily think Scripture lays it out with that level of detail for us. Mm. We, we're making, mm. drawing, I guess, assumptions out of what might be possible rather than what we can prove. We're, what, yeah. we're, what we're experiencing here in the panel is what you experience when you read the book. That it is. It's, oh. it's Might open this, to yes. interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but if you get the under, underlying yeah. principles right, yeah. oh. and the colour is designed to help you oh. do that, yeah. you can follow the sequence and yeah. you can yeah. be dressed in white when Christ comes. And what, what's really, really clear is that we have this progression, oh. which is what we're, we're picking up on, where... Christ has ascended to heaven, the devil is limited to earth, yeah. and, you know, he's now, as it says at the end of verse 12, he's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. How does he know his time is short? Because Jesus has defeated him at the cross. Yes. Mm. Um, and that's important, the context here of the casting down here, because it, 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 it appears that it, uh, the casting, this casting out of Satan here, the dragon, lost his place in heaven, it's in the context of the cross, uh, the context of the enthronement of, of Jesus mm. as king yeah. in heaven. Yeah. Well, he, um, could, he couldn't be enthroned as king until he had overcome Satan of course. and claimed the throne. Mm. Yeah. 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 So it means he is king now of this earth, but he hasn't yet claimed this earth as his realm. Yeah. yeah, but at least in heaven he's already, he's already acknowledged is, yeah. that he is. Uh, and, and I guess you see an interesting contrast between God's method of warfare and the devil's method of warfare. God um, <laughs> works according to the rules-based order, if you like. The devil has no rules. He can yeah. lie, mm. you know, destroy, whatever yeah. it be. Roman, I want to come to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 before we wrap up, which we need to do in a moment. Revelation 12, 17 talks about the dragon going to make war against the offspring of the woman, which seems to indicate he's been successful to a degree with the woman. And then it gives some identifying characteristics here of the offspring. Tell us, tell us just briefly about what's going on there. Well, that's, that's very important what is said here. So first, that's, you know, the woman disappears as, as, a, as a target for Satan. So it means that, that he succeeded this and, and now only the offsprings. And the offsprings have the characteristics. The text is saying uh, straight that, you know, they keep the commandments of God. Yeah. We are coming back to the law again mm -hmm. that we mentioned the last time. And, and, you know, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, the, so that's, they are very important characteristics because if we see the woman through the whole chapter uh, as a church, and now, we, well, still offsprings is the church. Uh, so that's a connection with the commandments of God. 
And that's the connection with, with the testimony of Jesus. That is also explained in the same book, you know, and will come in the 19th oh. chapter uh, to, to this, you know, that it is yeah. the testimony, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Mm. That's the spirit of prophecy. Mm. But, but let's leave it now uh, for a moment. But, but, you know, the commandments of God, obedience, it's extremely important. That's the result. Because they are offsprings, and Satan is attacking them. It means that they are still on the side of God. Mm. Yeah. Peter, I can see you want to well, leap into... In a, in a sense, yes. Yeah. The, the, the offspring are people who have the love of God in their heart. Yeah. But they're in, they're in a conflict that describes is described as the woman who was now no longer white but dressed as a, a prostitute, a harlot. Which we discover in Revelation 17. Mm, yes. Yeah. And as a harlot, mm. it means she who was pure is now impure. Mm. So th there is a church involved in this conflict up until the time of the end, yeah. but it is a church that is, rather than being pure and white, is mm. dressed as a prostitute. Yeah. Mm. I, the, the thing that this reminds me of, you know, this characteristics of God's people. Remember that with the, the woman at the well and Jesus in the conversation with her comes to the point of saying, you know, the, the, the end point where we'll end up is we will worship in spirit and in truth. Yeah. And when it talks about God's commandments and the testimony of Jesus, what I see is truth and spirit. Mm -hmm. And we can't have one without the other. We need both. We have a God who is loving and kind and compassionate. He understands that people have been in a war of deception and have been deceived. Mm. So he extends the, his love to all. Mm. We, if we recognise that we are red by colour and we're heading mm. towards the blackness of apostasy, we can turn around. Yeah. And he wants you to turn around and go back towards the white of truth and light. So the battle continues and the colours help give it reference. Yeah. And I think that's probably a great place to finish because the battle indeed does continue and, well, let's pray and we'll tell you about next week. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we've been able to discuss Revelation 12. There is such a rich vein of, of truth revealed to us as we, we see the devil unmasked and we see the ongoing work of Jesus. And Lord, we, we just pray that we might have that experience of worshipping you in spirit and in mm. truth, having the commandments and the testimony of Jesus, because that's when we have the, the full picture. Mm. And Lord, as we, we leave it for this session, we pray that you would go with us through each day and keep us strong in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when we come back next time, we're just going to do one chapter again. We could even do this over several sessions, but we're going to do it in one, Revelation chapter 13, and we get more insight into this battle, and we see two beasts and that feared 666 number, which we will get to discuss next time, and we hope to see you then.